welcome back and here we continue our discussion about the integrated function in the shoulder complex and you know that the integrated function in the shoulder complex is a function of integrated function by the joints and integrated function by the muscles so far we have completed our discussion about integrated function by the joints we have seen how sternoclavicular acromioclavicular scapulothoracic and glenohumeral joint is going to work together to produce the functional movements uh, or to produce movements or motions in the shoulder complex and we saw that during the arm elevation activity there is a glenohumeral joint that is elevating that is flexing or abducting at the same time there is a scapulothoracic joint providing upward rotation and various other movements associated with that and it's often known to us and you have already we have already discussed that the scapulothoracic joint is functioning as a closed chain between the sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular so during scapulothoracic upward motions there is a elevation and posterior rotation in the sternoclavicular and upward rotation in the acromioclavicular as a predominant movement and this is how we see that there is a rhythmic functioning or there is a contribution by each of uh, the joints in the shoulder complex towards the functional uh, range of motion or range of motion possible in the shoulder complex but uh, is that all no absolutely not because uh, the joints cannot work together alone uh, if there is no proper working of the muscles so there is the role of muscles which produce the motion which is predominant and we have to discuss it and right now we start the discussion of the role of muscles and since shoulder complex contains a large number of muscles associated with it or having its origin or insertion near to the joint this discussion is going to be a vast one but I will make it easy and simplified for you and here we do it for with the deltoid muscle we start with the predominant muscle of the shoulder complex or seemingly predominant muscle of the shoulder complex that is the deltoid muscle we will analyze what is the role of the deltoid muscle what's the action on the one is the peak action of the deltoid muscle at the same time see the pathomechanics and mechanics associated with the deltoid muscle tell you about the deltoid muscle something that you should remember or we should recollect is that deltoid is made up of three fibers which are the anterior fiber middle fiber and posterior fiber do not forget this and we take into two into two consideration or see two scenarios to analyze the action of the deltoid that is a uh, arm at side and arm at side and during the motion during the act during the motion or in between the motion now we know that when arm is at side that's the first scenario we had already discussed in dynamic stabilization that when arm is at rest, uh, side the deltoid is in its resting length and when it's purely uh, in the static state there is no muscle activity in the deltoid but when the movement is about to begin or there is a flexion or abduction about to happen the deltoid muscle will contract you know that when deltoid is contracting its action line will produce one problem that is it will produce the superior translatory component yes the deltoid muscle will produce a superior translatory component for example we have the uh, glenoid fossa over here right and the head of the humerus over here okay and this is the for example if this is the resting length we have our deltoid muscle over here like this we have the deltoid and we see that uh, the action line of the deltoid muscle is a uh, superiorly directed the action line of anterior middle and posterior can be uh, can be adjusted or can or assumed to be the action line of the middle so the f deltoid or the action line of the deltoid is superiorly directed but at the same time if this is a superior directed translatory force it will force the glenoid fossa or humeral head to translate superiorly and no movement will happen but we need the movement so that we we have some uh, what you call the synergistic activity of some group of muscles which you have already uh, gone through that is the itis muscle that is the infraspinatus teres teres minor and subscapularis so this muscles works as a force couple and or synergistic into the action of deltoid and thus 
cancel out that superior translatory pull. So when arm is at rest or when arm is at side, the deltoid when it is moving, it has a superior translatory pull which may not produce or which is not capable of producing the rotatory movement. We need the rotatory movement of the deltoid to happen, which can compromise that movement, but it is being balanced by the synergistic activity of the FITs, that is the infraspinatus, teres minor and subscapularis muscle. So as a result, the deltoid is free to move. Therefore, since or when these muscles are active, the deltoid act as a prime mover, prime mover of elevation. When these muscles are active, FITs muscles are active, deltoid muscle act as a prime mover of elevation. And that in that too, we have three fibers of the deltoid, right? I told you already, that is anterior, middle and posterior. Can you just recollect or can you just think on which fiber will be active during flexion? Any idea? Definitely that will be the anterior fibers. So the anterior fibers of the deltoid are predominantly active in flexion of the glenohumeral joint. When it is the flexion in the scapular plane, which is 30 to 40 degree from the coronal plane, this plane, that is the scapular plane, when it is doing the flexion, which fiber would be active? Just think on anterior and middle fiber will be active. So we got the point that is the anterior fibers are active in normal flexion in the sagittal plane, whereas the middle fiber and anterior are active in flexion in the uh, scapular plane. Both this middle and anterior are active in the scapular plane. And during abduction, pure abduction, of course, anterior and middle fiber are predominant role by the middle fiber. Okay, but what about the, our posterior fibers? Can we completely neglect it? Can we completely neglect it? Of course, we have to neglect it because it is having a very small momentum at the same time, very small rotatory moment. Well, top is very small momentum and small rotatory component. It is not able to provide the motion, but act as a joint compressor, but act as a joint compressor in the elevation activity. So we talked about, we talked about the deltoid and finally we arrive at the conclusion that deltoid is a prime mover of elevation. That's the first thing that you have to remember. And that was the first thing that you have to write when it's asked and anterior fiber it act as a flexor in the normal plane or such a plane movement and middle fiber it is the predominant uh, middle fiber and anterior fibers are active when it is a movement happening in the scapular plane and when the movement is poorly in the frontal plane it's a middle and anterior and more predominantly the middle fiber but the posterior fibers are not much active during the elevation activity and they are acting as a joint stabilizer or sorry joint compressor in during the elevation activity but of course they are active in horizontal abduction and the extension activities of the deltoid which you can imagine because the posterior fibers can help in extension of the glenohumeral joint okay and right now we have to understand that the deltoid machine uh, we discussed during the arm at the side now when what happens when the deltoid is in motion what happens the deltoid is in motion when deltoid is in motion or when deltoid is moving the thing that uh, changes over the scenario is that the glenoid fossa as well as the humeral head will change its position like this okay the glenoid fossa and the humeral head will it's change its position like this so what happens when the glenoid fossa or humeral head changes its position when arm is uh, getting moved you see that this f deltoid which was superior directed trans, uh, starts to come into the joint cavity so when deltoid is moving like this when the humerus is moving like this the fiber which was oriented in this direction for example with my marker i am showing this a will get oriented into the joint cavity so that is actually advantageous because it's going to compress the joint or provide stability to the joint at the same time of the movement so when arm is at moving or arm is at during the motion the deltoids f resultant or the deltoids transitory pull gets into the joint cavity and act as a stabilizer but at the same time you have to remember when arm is at side when arm is uh, moving like this of course the gravitational effect or the effect by the gravitational force is going to pull it down and pull it down so the third has to work to produce this motion so we see that uh, Considering all these factors, we see that there is a peak activity of the deltoid in 90 to 120 degree of range of motion. 
I want to tell you something that this is a very important topic with respect to your practical life because you have to analyze the patient with respect to the scenarios when deltoid is paralyzed or when other muscles are paralyzed. At the same time, if you're a student, you should be very thorough because uh, they have been asking and they are asking three months questions where the action of what is the action of serratus anterior, what is the action of deltoid in shoulder. You don't have to just write, if you write just the anatomy that deltoid is a flexor, deltoid is an abductor, you don't get the mark, you have to go for the biomedical mechanical analysis of the same. So uh, what we were saying that is that uh, during this movement uh, we see that there is a peak activity of the deltoid from 90 to 120 degree of uh, elevation activity. So we get the value that the uh, peak activity of the deltoid is uh, seen from uh, 90 to 1. Don't forget this. This may be asked somewhere or same question for any competitive exam so this is a 90 to 120 degree is the peak activity so before that and after that the activity of the deltoid decreases that is because of different factors like the during arm movement the translatory component gets into the joint cavity there is a greater effect of a gravitational torque or gravitational force when the arm is getting elevated at the same time you know that deltoid muscle when it is getting elevated like this the length of the muscle fiber decreases and it's not a muscle which greater with greater momentum you know that it's not a muscle with great momentum so as a result the effect of the muscle decreases but still it is able to compete or it's able to fight because of uh, it's a large cross-sectional area and the penate nature of the muscle fiber so it is ultimately able to produce a movement above the 9, 120 degree also even though it's facing a lot of challenges like this now we go on to discuss two pathomechanical conditions with respect to the delta the two pathomechanical scenarios with respect to the deltoid are first one it is the paralysis of uh, uh, upward rotators of the scapula so the scapula includes the serratus anterior and the trapezius muscle the serratus anterior and the trapezius muscle and of course the paralysis of uh, rotator cuff muscles which you know what are the which are the muscles so we already studied that there is an isometric length or there is a length tension relationship of the deltoid. What happens is that when the arm movement is been progressing, the deltoid length actually decreases because it's getting contracted. So this compensation or this contraction of the deltoid uh, will reduce the length, but that's not considerably effective because we know that the scapula is moving in upward rotation so that it maintains the length of that muscle. So, so when scapula is moving, the length of the muscle is uh, maintained to some extent and deltoid can function uh, predominantly in throughout the glenohumeral range of motion. But you analyze, uh, you analyze the scenario where the scapula is uh, fixed or restricted to move. What happens after a, after a considerable amount or arc of movement, the deltoid muscle is no longer in its position to generate power. It is going for insufficiency or reduced power generation. So when scapula is fixed or relatively not moving, uh, even though the deltoid is working, even though the supraspinatus is assisting it, we see that the shoulder range of motion may not be possible to the complete degree. That is the that is the thing that uh, the scapular movements are very important with respect to the deltoid muscle. And now the upward rotation of the scapula happens in the elevation, which we have studied already, which is actually produced by the upward rotators of the scapula, which are the serratus anterior and trapezius muscle. So if these two muscles are paralyzed, if there is no working of the serratus anterior and trapezius muscle, what happens is that the total available range of motion of deltoid activity decrease. And here is an interesting scenario that you know that there are three different fibers of the deltoid, okay? We have three different fibers of the deltoid. If this is the glenoid fossa, this is the humeral head. We have three different fibers, anterior, middle and posterior fibers. So what happens is that when these upward rotators are paralyzed, the middle and the posterior fiber will work in such a way that instead of moving this heavy arm, they will 
cause the rotation of the scapula in the opposite direction. What was the direction of a rotation of scapula in up, uh, elevation that is upward rotation? So these fibers which are in fact attached to the scapula will result in downward rotation of the scapula will result in the downward rotation of the scapula so when this muscle is, when this action is going to progress like this actually this is how it works there is an upward rotation but when this serratus anterior and trapezius are not working they are not stabilizing or they are not causing the upward rotation the deltoid muscles middle and posterior fibers will think that why should i move this heavy arm i can simply up downwardly downwardly rotate this one I can simply downwardly rotate the scapula instead of going for this upward rotation. Why should I bear the, all the weight of the arm? So as a result, when arm is moving like this, of course the anterior fiber will move the arm like this. The deltoid, uh, posterior fiber and middle fiber will result in a downward rotation of the arm. Still the motion will take place, but motion will take place in a downwardly rotated scapula as compared to upwardly rotated scapula. So what, uh, what happens is that the glenohumeral range of motion is decreased and maximum efficiency is to be not an, or maximum available range of motion decreased to 60 to 75 degree maximum available range of motion decreases to 60 to 70 degree so in normal scenario this was how it was moving both of them moves in a simultaneous manner but in this scenario when this moves in this direction this one moves in opposite direction this one moves in opposite direction downward rotation so as a result the range of motion is decreased so when there is a paralysis of serratus anterior and the trapezius muscle the available range of motion at the glenohumeral joint of the deltoid muscle decreases to about 60 to 75 degree only that is because the deltoid muscle becomes isometric sorry uh, the length of the deltoid muscle decrease or length tension relationship of the muscle decrease and it can no longer produce enough contraction or enough torque at the same time the upward rotators of the scapula are this muscles and if they are not working as, uh, what happens is that the middle and posterior fibers of the deltoid instead of moving the heavy arm tries to move the lighter scapula towards the downward rotation so the deltoid motion will take place but in a downward rotated scapula and also the length of the muscle is decreased or length tension of the muscle is uh, uh, at, sit, at its disadvantage so as a result of this total picture the available range of motion is going to decrease so when serratus anterior and the deltoid is muscle the patient will attempt to flex uh, abduct his arm but he may not be able to achieve the full degree he will try to move but he will achieve a lighter degree of range of motion only clear and at this scenario we need to move on to the rotator cuff muscles which you know that we already studied the itis muscle is very important to synergistically balance the deltoid and supraspinatus we'll see later so what happens if these muscles are paralyzed or if there is a tear in the rotator cuff tear in the rotator cuff the translatory pull of the deltoid is going to be unbalanced no one is going to balance that gravity is not going to do that it's not capable of doing that so what happens is that the deltoid will move for superior translation there is a predominant superior translation of the deltoid happening unchecked superior translation so what will happen is at the result as, as a result there is an elevation at the sternoclavicular joint and deltoid will move in this movement there is a shrugging movement so instead of getting the arm elevated there will be predominantly shrugging movement and some associated range of motion that is happening earlier it was like this okay the serratus anterior and trapezius is working but here we can clearly note down there is an increase in the elevation of the stratoclavicular joint at the acromiclavicular end or lateral end of the clavicle and there is a predominant shrugging role because the translated component is going to produce a superior pull so this is the story of the deltoid where deltoid is a prime mover but the ultimately at the end of the day we can say that deltoid is inefficient to work itself if the only deltoid is working, it's not able to produce the shoulder range of motion. It has to need the, it, it needs the stabilization role of uh, a serratus anterior trapezius. It is also highly dependent on the rotator cuff muscles. So a deltoid is a prime mover with the help of other muscles which are stabilizing it and with the proper biomechanics of the shoulder. We will see wind up this session and in the next session we move on to what is the role of supraspinatus, what is the individual role of itis muscle in shoulder complex biomechanics.
mechanics and here this question may be asked what is the role of deltoid so you have to write deltoid is uh, having anterior middle and posterior fibers you have to write which is happening what is the movement two scenarios at um, side arm at side and during motion uh, this you have to define this one how to define this one and finally you have to move on to two clinical conditions or two pathological conditions associated with this one is a weakness of the rotator anterior and the trapezius and another is a weakness of rotator cuff and finally at the end of the day picture a right rotator cuff a deltoid is capable of producing or becoming a prime mover with the help of stabilization rolled by rotator cuff muscles and serratus anterior and the trapezius muscle if you like the video don't forget to click the like button and kindly subscribe to our channel